Thank, thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today. Again, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Lockman for his hard work to, to make this event possible. Susie Hills and her team for the, the work as well for all the organisation that you can imagine goes into this event. The sponsors for today, again, a big thank you because without the sponsors we couldn't do it, and particularly the Howard Foundation for facilitating this, and Dr. Alan Howard who's with us today, and for making this beautiful um, theatre available to us to discuss something that I believe is extremely important. It, it, it's extremely close to my heart, and I've been very lucky to be able to work on it nearly for a decade um, with colleagues like Professor Beattie, Dr. Lockman, and uh, ac across the globe. The, I suppose as with science, uh, you know, things change and when I was asked to give titles for my lectures today, I had an idea in mind, but that was some months ago and you can imagine that we've evolved even since then and the message that I have has been updated since then. So again, I don't apologize for deviating a little bit from the title because there's some very new and exciting data that we have to discuss today. Particularly for me, in my field is, is nutrition, um, prevention. Professor Beattie was speaking about you know, AMD and he, you're going to hear later about how we treat that condition when the problem presents. I believe that my job as a scientist, someone that can inform science and medicine, is to discuss ways around prevention. And you'll see today that my message is clear on that, that we have to get busy early with respect to prevention if we are to deal with the problem that AMD currently presents. So, over the period of my two lectures today, there's three key messages that I want to hopefully deliver. One is, let's, we're going to remind ourselves about age-related macular degeneration, and I hear all the questions already about supplements and risk factors and, and where we stand with that. And so the first part of my lecture is, is essentially to deal with that. And the second part of my lecture will talk to you about you know, where we are with respect to the scientific studies, the trials and the evidence. And then we'll conclude by making recommendations on how the optometrist um, can be very important in this whole thing. And that's why I think speaking to the optometry community today is essential because if you think about it, the whole idea about prevention is, is, is getting at this problem early and who better than the first line of eye care provider and that is the optometrist. So I really believe that you guys have a very, very important and key role in dealing with AMD and, and the growing problem it presents. Okay, so we'll, we'll get on with it. Again, as with Professor Beatty, um, I do a lot of, I suppose, research and consultancy work for various companies, but the, the important message here is that scientific end, independence, editorial control, again, is, is, is um, within my capacity for all those relationships, and obviously that's important as an independent scientist. We've, we're based in Waterford and we've been working there since um, Professor Beatty established the lab in 2001-2002. Originally from seed funding from Fighting Blindness Ireland, we were able to buy some small pieces of equipment to, to get going with this. And, and we essentially did. And since then we've secured about 5 million euros <coughs> worth of funding um, to, to allow us ask and answer many important research questions. And this has been achieved by an infrastructure that you see here with various equipment, but also by a multidisciplinary research approach. And that's essential when you look at the disease that is macular degeneration. It's a, it's a, it's a problem that has many factors and many, and many areas that contribute to that. So if you're to address that problem, you need expertise across ophthalmology, statistics, biochemistry, vision science. So that's our model, that's our working model in terms of how we do research. We, we share and work towards the different expertise. As well, collaboration with the local hospitals and the national hospitals with access to AMD patients is key. And I think it's a strength of what we can achieve in Ireland. I think it's something based on the size of Ireland that gives us an opportunity to collaborate closely and actually get direct access to patients. And I think that's, that's an advantage for us and we've been, we've been using that. The disease that you've seen this morning about the, the different stages of the disease and essentially this is the type that we're, we're, we're trying to stop. The implications of that are a loss of central colour vision, inability to read, write, recognise the loved one's face. So, it's, so the patient's social independence is, is totally destroyed and it costs a lot of money, AMD, to deal with the problem. Not just by the treatment but the indirect costs patient care and so on and so forth. So it's, it's a very expensive problem for, for Europe, for the UK and for Ireland and its healthcare providers. So um, the first part now of my background is 
<coughs> is to deal with the various risk factors for age-related macular degeneration. And I'll initially speak about prevalence and incidence. Before the age of 55, it, it, it's rare. People very seldom have issues with macular degeneration before that age. But as we move beyond that, it becomes more and more common. And you'll see why here. This <coughs> echoes that point that we look at, <coughs> excuse me, we look at early stage age-related macular degeneration and it is more common. But once we move past 65 to 70, you can see that the incidence of this starts to, to increase. It's only about 0.2% in persons aged 55 to 64, and it rises to about 13% in individuals 85 years of age and older. So it's a problem that's essentially associated with age. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm just going to take a drink of water. Okay, so if we're talking about an age-related problem, here, here's, the, here's the direct problem. We're all living longer, and if we look at the the graph here, we can see that it's predicted that by the year 2020, the number of people that have this condition will in fact double. And, and that, that's a really frightening statistic. Let me give you another statistic that I think you'll be interested in. Of females born in the last five years, there's a 50% chance that they live beyond the age of 100. Now, all those individuals will have some signs of age-related macular degeneration. So, so here lies the strength of, of this epidemic that presents. AMD currently accounts for 50% of total blindness, and this is data from the World, <clears throat> from the World Health Organization. Okay, the elderly section of the population is becoming an ever-increasing proportion of the overall population. You can see here by the turquoise color, there's just more and more old people around, and therefore more and more people will have age-related macular degeneration. The population itself continues to increase. <coughs> So we've recently published a paper looking at the risk factors. So what risk factors are important for age-related macular degeneration? What risk factors have minimum input? So <clears throat> we spent several years looking at all the data. <coughs> Sorry, I, my voice is eluding me today. Um, we spent many years looking at the risk factors for age-related macular degeneration. And we looked at the very high impact journals and the odds ratios that were presented from those journals. What we found was that there's a clear message available to us, a message around the risk factors, and I want to discuss some of those. Firstly, we look at genetics, and like any disease, our genes are very important predictors of whether we develop the disease or not. And this is due to variants in, in, in allenes. We know with family history that first-degree relatives, like sons and daughters, are nearly more than double the risk of developing this condition. Interestingly, if you look at grandparents, it, it tends to skip a, a generation. The Beaver Dam eye study, which was one of the big eye studies uh, looking at this, um, was conclusive in, in that report. Once we knew that family history was important, studies into twin studies were conducted. Firstly, some studies in monozygotic twins, dizygotic twins, have, have helped us understand even more the implications of, of genetics. For example, when we look at monozygotic twins, we can see that it's more common that, and the risk is increased if it's from the same gene. However, with dizygotic twins, although the risk is, is still enhanced, it's not as severe as the monozygotic. Zed and et al. published very nice data showing that the genes can count for up to 70% of your risk of macular degeneration. And this is a very, very important statistic indeed. Once we knew that family history was important, it made sense that the geneticists got busy and started looking at the various risk genes for macular degeneration. So using their expertise, they, we now know what genes are actually important for age-related macular degeneration. We know that the complement factor H gene and the ARM, also known as the LOC gene, are the major risk genes for this condition. Indeed, and the important message here is that if you have both risk genes, your risk is multiplied. And you can see here that, <clears throat> again, up to the 60-70% combined risk when you have the both risk genes. So what does this mean for the optometrist? It, how, can, how can this be used? Well, there's now genetic tests that can be performed very easily um, by performing mucosal swabs. That if you have patients that you're worried about, sons and daughters of people th with this condition, you can actually do a very simple mucosal swab, send it to a laboratory, and you can identify whether they have these risk genes or not. 
One other gene that deserves um, mention is the, the apolipoprotein gene. And there's some studies showing that this gene is, is positive, reduces risk, and so, some other studies show that a variant of that gene is actually increases your risk. So this is another gene that has come out in the literature to, to be important. Um, the E4 is less common in AMD, whereas the E2 allele is associated with increased risk of AMD. Cigarette smoking, I heard someone that asked a question on it. <clears throat> the importance around cigarette smoking is it is the most important modifiable risk factor for age-related macular degeneration. So what I mean there is there's nothing we can do about our age, there's nothing we can do about our genetics, but there's a lot we can do with respect to the lifestyle factor that is cigarette smoking. <clears throat> when you look at all the studies that have been conducted and you get an average of the odds ratios, we see that on average we are about two and a half times more likely to develop the disease if you smoke uh, cigarettes. The data is very consistent here, showing that nearly 80% of studies have shown an important relationship and a negative relationship between smoking cigarettes <clears throat> and your risk of age-related macular degeneration. Why is cigarette smoking? How does it have an impact? Well, vascular changes in the eye is one. Reduced circulating levels of antioxidants, and that's something around the macular pigment area that um, we will be talking about later on, but reducing circulating levels of antioxidants, increased pro-oxidant load, and reduce macular pigment level is, is the key message here. So we know that if you smoke cigarettes, even when you control for dietary changes, that individuals have less macular pigment when compared to non-cigarette smokers. Obesity, as Professor Beatty also mentioned, is a risk factor. Again, about one and a half times more likely to get the disease in, when you compare obese populations to non-obese populations. Again, the link there, we believe there's an important link with obesity and nutrition because of the inappropriate dietary habits um, in the obese population. And it also because the carotenoids, which I'm going to speak about um, in a little bit, um, actually are stored in fat. So one can imagine competition between body fat and the actual circulating levels of the antioxidants. Light exposure, very difficult to, to comment on light because it's very difficult to quantify light exposure in the population. How does one assess light? Light you have to control for eye level, brow level, sunglass use, hat use, long latitudes and longitudes of, of, of the particular area. So it's extremely difficult to, to try and um, quantify that, but it does come out to be an important risk factor for age-related macular degeneration. If I was to ask a question about light to this audience, what part of the light spectrum would one think is, is actually important for age-related macular degeneration? UV, visible or infrared. Could I get a show of hands for UV? Could I get a show of hands for visible? Could I get a show of hands for infrared? And the answer I got here is the same I get every time I, I ask this question. And the show of hands was for UV. It's actually the incorrect answer. And the reason why it's incorrect is that our lens and our cornea does a very, very good job at filtering the UV. The UV, remember, is the high energy. So this high energy light, if it was incident on the retina continuously, it will be extremely damaging because of its short wavelength, high energy. But in order for us to have vision, we need to have visible light incident on, on, on the retina. The blue part of that visible light is also short wavelength, it's very close to UV, but it is allowed to get through to the retina. And again, that's important around the macular pigment story, which I'll come on to in a little bit. Female sex, there was a suggestion that um, female gender is, is a risk factor for macular degeneration. I believe, looking at the literature, as I've just done now, that it's actually more related to the fact that females live longer. And I, I do not see um, female gender as an independent risk factor for age-related macular degeneration. There may be a rela important um, interactions with um, hormones, etc., but I don't think the data is conclusive here just yet. <coughs> So there's many other risk factors, and I'll quickly <clears throat> mention them. There's cardiovascular disease, hypertension, plasma lipids, um, all have <clears throat> inconclusive um, reports around their importance. <coughs> Physical 
in activity, again, lifestyle and activity, I believe, to be related to lifestyle, dietary habits, etc. Iris color may be one you're interested in. <clears throat> And iris colour is important because of melanin and non-blue eyes have less melanin and, and therefore are believed to be at more risk than, um, or less risk than blue eye individual. Alcohol consumption, I'm often asked this question, and if you're like me on a Saturday night, you start with a beer, you're increasing your risk of AMD, but if you finish with a glass of wine, you may be okay because you may reduce that risk a little bit, so that, that should work. But again, the message here is that a combined relationship with lifestyle is, is what's important. And that really takes me on. We've, we've summarized the risk factors, um, and you know, it, it should be clear that the main risk factors are age, cigarette smoking, and family history. And two of those, there's very little we can do about. One, cigarette smoking, absolutely. Let's advise our patients not to smoke cigarettes. And it's easier said than done to get compliance around that suggestion. Um, regarding Nutrition, I believe, as I say, this is a very, very important modifiable risk factor also. And now we're going to show you some data on this. The ophthalmologist in Ireland and the ophthalmologist in the UK will, will often and very commonly um, say there's no evidence for nutrition and macular degeneration. And, and the reason why I believe, and this is quite a controversial statement, but I'm going to say it anyway, is that they're not very familiar and they haven't invested the time in looking at the literature around this. And it's not their job essentially to do it, they're, they're treating and managing a, a disease more often. But our job, I suppose, as scientists is, is to look at the evidence and its totality, the various types of evidence, not just around the gold standard clinical trials, but the smaller trials from different institutes, observational data. And we've just actually had a paper um, pretty much accepted for publication commenting on this very point around the evidence that's available. And we have a very clear message which I'm going to discuss with you today. I see my student here, Sarah Pickard, who's, who's um, sent that, that paper in. But the message is, let's quickly try and get to the point. If you look at the um, observational data around nutrition and whether someone has high intake of lutein and zeaxanthine and their risk of AMD, you can see very clearly that there's an underlying message and that's over 80% of studies report a positive and statistically significant association between nutrition and age-related macular degeneration. I think that's pretty conclusive and it's, it is important type of evidence. Again, looking at serum, you see a very similar message. Over 80% of the studies that measured serum values in individuals, lutein, zeaxanthin, and correlated that to whether they had AMD or not, show a very, very beneficial effect of having elevated high serum levels. Omega-3 is something that, you know, it's not my area of expertise, but it's something that's very topical at the minute. And again, the omega-3 can be addressed by looking at the observational um, evidence and because the main, the main data that's there is observational in nature. And the idea here is that obviously with AMD the f uh, photoreceptors, the polyunsaturated fatty acids are destroyed. The idea here is that if you replenish that with omega-3 you can, you can fix a problem. But you know there's another theory and, and it's something that Professor Beattie and I discuss quite often and that's the potential here for omega-3 not to be a good thing. And if you think of it like fueling a fire. Essentially, when you speak about AMD, you're looking at oxidative stress attacking the substrate that is the, the polyunsaturated fatty acids. So if you're putting more fuel into the fire, you may be actually contributing to and generating an overreactive retina, which may have implications for age-related macular degeneration. I, it, it's clear here that the, the, the data isn't consistent around either hypothesis. Based on, I suppose, commercial interest, etc., you will be told a lot of good news around um, omega-3. No, no different, I suppose, to the macular pigment story. But for me, the jury still is out on, on the importance of omega-3. And it wouldn't be something that I personally would uh, advise or recommend uh, patients at risk or with macular degeneration to, to have right now. And as I say, there's a paucity of evidence for either of these hypotheses. Um, this was one paper in support, um, published by the Blue Mountains Eye Study, in support of omega-3. And as I say, there is a lot of observational data here in support of this. But overall, and in conclusion around when we speak about the evidence for age-related macular degeneration, I think it's absolutely fair to conclude as follows. It's not conclusive yet. 
bigger clinical trials such as what the ARIDS2 study um, will provide are essential if we are to answer and really understand this question. In addition, <coughs> clinical trials specific to the macrocrotonoids such as what we are conducting in our laboratory in Waterford are essential also. But if you look at the, the evidence that is available again, and even if you look at the clinical trials, and Dr. Lockman, I believe, will be discussing these throughout the day, you can see that when you supplement specifically with the macular carotenoids, you're doing a lot of good for patients with age-related macular degeneration. If you look at the, the studies that we're familiar with, the, the last study, um, Stuart Richer, um, as Professor Beattie said, we submitted a paper yesterday um, with uh, Queen's University on lutein supplementation. You can see here that there's beneficial effects and you reduce the rate of progression of macular degeneration in patients with early AMD and you reduce the rate of the movement to advance. Yes, more work is required, but if you look at the observational and if you look at the cross-sectional data, the message is very clear and in support of macular carotenoids for reducing the risk of age-related <coughs> macular degeneration. Um, so the point is around all these risk factors that we've been talking about. We said that genetics is very important. If you have both bad genes, your risk is multiplied and it, it creates a very, a very bad situation for you. But it is a multifactorial risk or, or disease. It is many contributing factors. And therefore, the message is, and the idea here is that even if you have the bad genes, there's a lot we can do around our lifestyle, our habits, our nutrition to push that back. For example, this patient here, or this group of patients have the bad genes and they're predisposed to get age-related macular degeneration at, say, late age 60. Now, this, these group of patients have two choices. They have the bad genes, they can go off, smoke cigarettes, have a bad diet, have no uh, macular carotenoids in their diet, um, don't protect their eyes from sunlight. These individuals will actually bring on the age at which they'll get age-related macular degeneration, so they'll get it a lot earlier. Uh, along the same vein, if you have the good genes, that doesn't mean that you're guaranteed not to get macular degeneration as well, because if you, if you um, do all the bad things that I've just said, again, you're going to bring on the age at which you get macular degeneration. So the message is that while our genes do predispose us and determine the age at which we're likely to get disease, there's a lot we can do around lifestyle, and I believe smoking cessation and nutrition key um, t to that. Um, and you know, in, over the last uh, six, eight weeks, the data around what I've just been saying coming out from very respective institutes has been extremely supportive of what we're just saying here. And let's just look at some of them. The prevalence of AMD, I'm contradicting myself from my very first slide where I said AMD is going to continue to grow because we're all living longer and so on. We've just had a publication that shows that the prevalence of AMD is in fact less now in the US and they, they attribute that to smoking cessation and um, nutritional habits. So already we're proving that, that idea that if you do the right things you can really reduce the, the burden that AMD presents. And you can see here overall the prevalence of AMD um, has been reduced to 6.5% from 9.4% that's a significant reduction for the population. Again around my point and the Koy et al publication where we said if you optimize your risk profile, you, even if you have the bad genes, you, 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 can, you can have a, an impact there. This was just published from the Rotterdam Eye Study, um, reducing the genetic risk of age-related macular degeneration. And this is an extremely important message and an extremely important publication because again, up until now, people may have felt that, oh God, if they have the bad genes, there's no point, there's nothing they can do. Positive optimization will, will indeed help, as, as this paper has suggested. Julie Mars um, and her team have also published a similar message. And these are all very recent publication, healthy lifestyles related to subsequent prevalence of age-related macular degeneration. Modifying lifestyles might reduce risk of early AMD as much as threefold. So again, the message is very consistent here. We need to get busy early. We need to optimize the risk profile and overall reduce the risk. And <clears throat> I'll be speaking about this in the afternoon, but there is ways that optometrists are currently doing that and using um, technology such as what Citrus offer. It takes all this information, all these many risk factors, it tabulates them in a way, gives the, 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 um, the doctor and the patient a very clear message on what particular and 
personalised risk factors they need to optimise to reduce such risk. And, and this type of software technology is now being used um, ac across the globe by op op primarily opt opt optometrists. Um, that takes me essentially to the, the last but the main point of what I want to speak to you about this morning, and that is um, macular pigment and what we know with respect to, to studies on macular pigment for age-related macular degeneration and augmenting macular pigment. But in order to understand my slides, let's just remind ourselves again why we get AMD. Professor Beattie has alluded to it already. It's the result of cumulative and chronic oxidative um, stress. And this is simply caused by free radicals. And a free radical, quite simply, is an unstable molecule produced in the body as we use oxygen to stay alive. Professor Beattie explains it to his patients as the cost of living. Okay, so as we use oxygen to stay alive, a byproduct of that is a free radical which is unhappy, it's unstable. And you know what's really important here is that the retina is the ideal location for the production of these free radicals. It's a very high, it produces a lot of these free radicals. But in addition, the retina has an abundance of substrates, the polyunsaturated fatty acids, which, um, which these free radicals can attack. So it's a very reactive um, part of the body for this. We spoke about light damage, and again, we're talking about cumulative and chronic exposure to light. Remember, UV, yes, can be very damaging for our eyes if we do not protect against it. That's why after cataract surgery, we put in UV filters, but it is the visible part of the light spectrum, the visible light, and Dr. Lockman will mention later, I'm sure, that in all these new energy lamps that we are receiving, there is a lot of blue, and this is going to create a, a, another problem because of the blue component of those lamps. So cumulative and chronic light exposure over a person's lifetime. And if you think of what I've just said, I've said cumulative and chronic attack by, by, by free radicals, which is caused by oxygen metabolism and also by blue light causes um, uh, free radicals. Again, cumulative and chronic. If you just think about that for a second, the protection and the prevention that we can give ourselves, by definition, therefore, has to be cumulative and chronic or cumulative over a person's lifetime. You know, there's no silver bullet when the patient has it. There you go, take that, and the problem goes away. We have to get busy early, and particularly with nutrition. Okay, um, we spoke about uh, the link between inflammation, oxidative stress. This was always something that was confusing. A very important publication in, in um, Nature um, uh, showed the unique link between um, the oxidative stress being the trigger essentially and um, the inflammation being the bullet that, that, that does the damage. And there we know that there's a direct link between those. Um, which takes me to carotenoids. So what, when we speak about macular pigment, what are we actually uh, talking about? We're talking about plant pigments found in nature. There's over 600 of them. In our diet, there's anything up to maybe 60. But what was unique, and one of the things that grabbed me when I started this research was that at the retina, there was three and only three. And as a biochemist, I found that to be intriguing. The biological selectivity, that the body took the trouble to take from the possible 600 in nature, 60 in a diet, three, and place them uniquely at the macula. Now, lutein, zeaxanthin, and the central component is mesozeaxanthin. Okay. Again, here we can see the specific biological location right at the center of the fovea, right where we have sharpest um, visual acuity, color appreciation, the most important part of the retina, essentially. And here you can see it here. It extends out to about seven, eight degrees of eccentricity where it's optically detectable. So the first thing we should see without even thinking about it is that it, it must be there for a reason. And our job is to really understand that reason. <coughs> In terms of how it can impact on age-related macular degeneration, I think this slide is very nice to help us understand that. Here we can just imagine a situation that an individual has no macular pigment, poor diet or maybe bad genetics that they haven't been able to accumulate um, the macular pigment in the eye. Here we see again free radicals produced, again no fault to, the, to this individual, free radicals are produced in abundance in this part of the eye. Blue light from the visible light spectrum is incident on, on the retina, and you can, see, you can see it here. That, again, contributes to the production of these free radicals. So now we have a situation where the important cells of vision, 
the photoreceptors are destroyed over a person's lifetime. Eventually, once you hit saturation point, there results in cell death, similar to what we see in macular regeneration. This has been shown very nicely in vitro in, 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 in animal models. If we look then at a situation where we have macular pigment, <clears throat> you can see that there's two things, two important things that happen here. Number one, there's less blue light incident on the retina, and that's very, very important because we learn later that blue light is not actually very important for vision at all. In fact, blue light is very problematic for vision. We have no blue cones in the center of our eye. Um, but also, it's the highest energy of the visible light spectrum, so it produces these free radicals. So you picture a situation that we filter that, there's two important things happen. Number one, we stop the excessive ex exposure of blue light in that part of the eye. But number two, as the free radicals are produced, albeit in smaller amounts, the, the antioxidant properties of this yellow pigment are key to um, reducing the problem that, that would otherwise present. So therefore, it's a protective shield for, for interior, at least for, against age-related macular degeneration. So what do we know? We've spoken about the risk factors. We've spoken about the fact that at the back of the eye we have a yellow pigment that's ideally located and has the ideal optical and antioxidant properties to help with this problem that is age-related macular degeneration. Is there a link between macular pigment and these risk factors? And the answer is absolutely yes. <clears throat> we published in um, 2007 a very nice paper that showed that the major risk factors for age-related macular degeneration family history, age, and cigarette smoking are uniquely linked with having deficient levels of macular pigment. In other words, if you have the bad genes, and even if you control for diet and everything else that's going on, you're more likely to have less of this yellow macular pigment than individuals that do not have the bad genes. Older people, and this is something that has been debated with in our field, but my data um, suggest, and I, I believe the, the majority of data suggests that as we get over, there is a subtle decline in, in macular pigment levels. And the final thing, as I've already said, that cigarette smokers have less macular pigment, even if you take into consideration poor dietary habits and control for that. So the main risk factors for age-related macular degeneration are associated with having less of this pigment decades before the disease onset. So we're not talking about AMD patients here, guys. We're talking about 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds at various risk. The increased risk is associated with less pigment. And I think that's a very, very important message. And it's consistent with what I've been saying. We need to get busy early. We need to optimize this retinal nutritional pigment if we're to impact on this disease. More recently, we've shown in, in, in another study that <clears throat> not only not only are these individuals that, by definition, are at increased risk of AMD because they're older, they smoke cigarettes, or they have a family history, not only are they deficient in the pigment, but they have what we've identified and published as a central dip, which is, in our opinion, an undesirable profile of macular pigment. And, in, and we hypothesize that this dip in pigment is actually due to a lack of mesozeaxanthin, the central macular carotenoid. And that's what the remainder of my slides are going to deal with and how we, how we look at that and how we can supplement to try and remove that problem. Um, obesity, again, as I said, another risk factor associated with a lack of pigment. Professor Radney Hammond has published on this. I've published on this. Um, and we even just published an interventional study, as Professor Beattie said, if you achieve weight loss, for example, the idea is that you can reduce the risk that AMD presents. We've shown that if, if you can achieve weight loss, you can significantly increase your serum carotenoid levels, consistent with the notion that um, the macular carotenoids are actually stored in, 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 in body fat. So it's all about optimization of risk profile here. That takes us to mesozeaxanthin. Very, very newly discussed, very, very new in our field. I see Professor Bone and, and Landrum have joined us from, from America. Um, they were responsible for identifying this very important central um, macular carotenoid. And what's very interesting about mesozeaxanthin is we believe that it's not in high amounts in the diet, <coughs> if at all. It, it, I, my own belief is that it is in certain foods, and there's some data to back that up. But let's just be clear, it's not in a typical Western diet. It's not in the breakfast or the lunch that, that we're going to have today, I, I believe. Um, <clears throat> but the body, again, and this goes back, remember my biological selectivity comment, 
Here again, the body goes to extreme lengths to generate mesozeaxanthin in the retina. So Professor Bowen Landham hypothesized that, that, that it was achieved by a transformation of um, lutein uh, to mesozeaxanthin. And there was a study, a very nice study, um, conducted to, to actually um, test that hypothesis. And here we see the, the monkeys deprived from all Santafil, so from all carotenoids, and therefore remember, again, macular pigment is entirely of dietary origin, so if we eat no fruits and vegetables, you will have no yellow spot, you will have no nutritional pigment in the back of the eye. You have a lot of control over the amount of yellow pigment you have. <coughs> so the message is, if you eat no fruits and vegetables, you'll have none. So that's what happened, these monkeys. Then what happened was, we gave them a diet of lutein, and we gave them a diet of zeaxanthin only. Post-mortem, when the retinas were assessed, the monkeys that were given lutein only had indeed lutein and mesozeaxanthin, whereas the monkeys given a diet of zeaxanthin only had only zeaxanthin. And that confirmed the idea that lutein was in fact the carotenoid, that the body takes the trouble to convert at the retina. And again, it obviously does that for a reason. Biochemically, that makes sense because it requires the it requires the movement of um, a, a double bond, or sorry, a hydrogen bond um, in the end chain. And it makes sense that that would be the, the one to happen. How that happens, it's, it's probably enzymatic. It may have uh, impacted by, by, by light at, at some level, but it, the body, um, we believe, can do this. But it may not be able to do it in everybody. And that's where this gets very interesting. I believe that the individuals, and I believe there's a genetic link between the generation of mesozeaxanthin at the retina, which, again, may have implications for age-related macular degeneration. What if the, the genetic person with the bad genes are the very people that are unable to generate mesozeaxanthin from lutein? This suggests that they are, for sure, at increased risk of macular degeneration if we accept the protective properties that this pigment offer. A very important study on the macular carotenoids from um, Professor Paul Bernstein's lab in, in Salt Lake City has just come out as well and that has shown us very nicely that you know one may say should we be supplementing with lutein, should we be supplementing with zeaxanthin, should we be supplementing with mesozeaxanthin, which one is better? They all have different, pro different um, biochemical properties while they're very similar in structure um, they, they have different antioxidant capacity and so on and so forth. They have different abilities to filter light because they're positioned in the eye in, at, at different um, ways. I believe the message is, is clear from the, from the literature that a combination of all three is what's required if you are to optimise and enrich pigment in the way that I believe it can protect against age-related macular degeneration or the process that essentially causes age-related macular degeneration. And um, Paul's lab has shown this very nicely that a combination of three give a much better antioxidant effect. So its ability to quench the free radicals than if you have just one, even at the same amount. So if you have, say, 20 milligrams of lutein versus um, a combined uh, 20 milligram even at the same amount, the combined effort was indeed what had the much better effect. Um, and I think that makes sense. If you have a, a structure such as macular pigment that's made up of three parts, if you want to optimise that and enrich it in a way that it can have benefit, it makes sense that you optimise um, each individual component. Um, that's essentially what I've just said. So, MZ obviously therefore deserves special mention because it's been discussed at length, the studies and the clinical trials are now underway to discuss mesozeaxanthin, but there's a lot of uh, talk, is it in the diet, is it safe, and let, let's just look at, at some of that. It's produced in nature, birds make MZ um, in the retinas in, and it's stored in oil droplets. In the chicken retinas, 47% of uh, total zeaxanthin is also mesozeaxanthin. Turkey, turkey retinas, 28% of total zeaxanthin is indeed mesozeaxanthin. And of course for birds, etc., vision is very, very important. We learn about the, the, the visual performance hypothesis around this pigment um, later on. Fish is, is, is definitely a source of, of mesozeaxanthin and it's stored in, in the skin. And I have another slide that will show that, that uh, clear. Um, the, the Atlantic salmon being one and um, uh, trout so, how do we get it? It's available, as you know, in the UK in, in a supplement. 
in a supplement known as uh, Maca Shield. How do we get it? It's generated from the marigold plant. Again, there's a chemical um, there's a chemical process that converts lutein into the mesozeaxanthin, which can result in yields up to 80% of um, uh, mesozeaxanthin. So that's how we can get it into to a supplement form. Is it in diet? The honest answer is that you know it's it's not been really tested for at length because you'll see today on some of the posters um, that we have that you know the, the method around quantifying mesozeaxanthin isn't isn't very very easy and I think there's probably three maybe four labs in the world capable of doing it and um, our own lab is one of those but for one subject for example it can take anything up to three hours to to um, just run and, and, and get the mesozeaxanthin. But we're optimizing the methodology and that's one of the, the messages from the, the, the posters today. It has, however, and the ri ri originally why mesozeaxanthin was generated was to um, enhance the, the appearance of, of um, hens um, and the, the bright color and, and, and the egg yolks. And so it has been around and been consumed for some time um, in, in diets such as what we see in um, egg yolks from hens fed mesozeaxanthin. And um, Professor Thurman has, has published some data on that also. Um, is it safe? <laughs> People say there's no safety studies. The, when I've just had to look at this, because we've just submitted a paper actually looking exactly on, on the safety of, of uh, carotenoids, and particularly mesozeaxanthin for human consumption. And I would actually say there's probably more data available on the safety of mesozeaxanthin than there is on lutein or, or zeaxanthin. So there's animal studies, the, the typical and standard um, uh, animal studies, um, the AMAs tests and so on, have tested this. And in, a, in amounts far exceeding what would, one would consume in a dietary supplement, it has shown to be, uh, have no adverse effects there. <clears throat> there's now clinical trials underway and we've just um, got data from human safety studies where we collaborated with uh, the Irish laboratory, Clayman Laboratories, where we performed a full um, barrage of safety. And we, again, we have a poster on that that I suggest you, you have a look at. But the message is from the, the, the tests and the uh, performed at that laboratory, there is absolutely no suggestion of any adverse effects um, following consumption of mesozeaxanthin. We've already published some data as a clinical trial, albeit a pilot study um, comes in on whether one responds because the, op the optometrist needs to be confident that if you're recommending a supplement that contains the macular carotenoids, including mesozeaxanthin, it, are the patients getting value for that? Do they respond in serum? Do they respond in the eye? And we published a paper <clears throat> augmentation of macular pigment following supplementation with all three carotenoids and we were able to detect response in serum and in the eye following supplementation with this. Um, so that's published and I'm, I'm sure that literature is available for you today. Um, the Health Foundation have supported several trials around mesozeaxanthin and two o'clock this morning I was still changing the, the, the slides hence why maybe my voice is poor today. Um, the, <clears throat> but we have some very new data now that I'm pleased to, to show you on that. If we look at the study design briefly, 72 subjects, 36 normal, so no disease, no ocular pathology, 36 with early a um, AMD. We assessed them at baseline two weeks, four weeks, six weeks and, and eight weeks because we really wanted to test and look at how they respond to this supplement over a short period of time. We had three groups. One group consisted um, of an intervention that were given lutein, uh, high amounts of lutein, 20 milligrams, two milligrams of zeaxanthin and no meso. The second group were given <coughs> um, 10 milligrams of mesozeaxanthin, 10 milligrams of lutein and two milligrams of zeaxanthin. And the third group were given um, high amounts of mesozeaxanthin and small amounts of lutein. The reason why you will see here that where you have um, where you have meso, you're going to have some lutein is because if you remember that transformation from the marigold, you cannot get 100% pure meso. So that was the purest um, we could get. So the main outcome measure here was to, to macular pigment. And in the afternoon session, I'm going to speak to you about measurement of macular pigment because this is one of the messages I have for you, what I think you should do around the measurement. <clears throat> in the scientific lab, we use um, device um, produced by Professor uh, Billy Wooden from Brown University. Um, 
uh, macular matrix and you actually there's a there's a clinical version of that available I believe in at the stands today so you can have a look but the scientific version allows us to use um, the principle of flicker photometry to measure macular pigment and it allows us measure very uh, at very sensitive levels but across the entire spatial profile if you remember ideally the pigment has a mountain shape okay so it peaks at the center and decreases as, as you move across um, the eye we use what we call customized flicker photometry. Again, I'll come back to that later, but the take home message is that we believe it to be the best method available, the gold standard for, for measuring pigment, hence why we use it in scientific studies. It can take, when you do the full spatial profile, it can take anything up to 40 minutes um, to perform a measurement, and that's obviously not suitable for, for the clinical setting. But in order to get the data that we want, that's, that's what we do. We, measure bloods and we, we measure serum, um, we take blood samples to measure if, this, if the carotenoids are getting into the bloods and we do that using technology with high performance liquid chromatography and we use, working with Professor Torm, we, we use assays to quantify lutein and zeaxanthin first and then uh, mesozeaxanthin and Katie, another one of my students, has a poster on that that you may be interested in, in, in seeing today. But um, here we see the baseline, it's a busy slide, but all you need to take from this slide is that when you split the groups, the three intervention groups, there was no difference at baseline with any of the important factors such as um, their age or their body mass index. So by the randomization process allowed us to have kind of a very level and fair starting point to make comparison. Um, as you can see here, we've quantified the, the bloods at baseline as well, and you can see that given that mesozeaxanthin is, is not normally found in the diet, there's very little, if any, um, in serum pre-supplementation with this carotenoid. So we actually have some very, I believe, important data that has come out from this study. And let's, let's, let me try and explain it to you. Firstly, let's look at the lutein response. Group one, um, lutein response, 20 milligrams. As expected, you can see an increase, significant increase in serum lutein here um, by, by eight weeks. It peaked at about, or it's stable rather, at about 228% um, increase. So that's a very significant increase. But that was with 20 milligrams of lutein. Okay. When you look at the group that were given 10 milligrams of lutein, 10 MZ and 2 Z, they actually achieved a better um, response with respect to, to lutein. Now there's various reasons why this may have happened. One may be the subjects themselves responded differently. That's unlikely given the comparable starting points. It may be that, that you have enough in 10 milligrams of lutein to, to get um, the, the saturation response that one looks for. But also, and, and think about this, it may be that by having the combined antioxidants consumed, that it, they facilitate and they support each other with respect to the uptake into the blood. And that, that's what I actually believe. I believe that having these together facilitates the overall all process. Um, so again, the message here is that, that 10 achieved... Um, 10 achieved just as good as 20 with respect to lutein. Um, so that's comparing group one and group two. Group three, and this is a very novel and I believe important finding. We're talking about, um, um, sorry, no, that's the next slide. Group three, as you can imagine, <coughs> had very little lutein. So the response in lutein here was a lot smaller, although they did respond to the two milligrams that was there. When we look at cesantin, Across all groups, cesantin was in smaller uh, concentrations. Um, between the three groups, you're looking at two, you're looking at two and none here. <clears throat> the blue line being none, there was no change as, as one would expect. There was no change in, in cesantin. But we saw an increase here, a comparable increase um, between the two groups with the two milligrams of zeaxanthin. So that's important. But here's probably the most important outcome from this um, intervention. And that was... If we look at uh, group one, sorry, group three is the first one to look at 18 milligrams of mesozeaxanthin. That, as expected, gave you the biggest increase in mesozeaxanthin. That's a lot of mesozeaxanthin, but it gave you the biggest increase. Um, you can't calculate percentage increase here because if you're starting from zero. If you look at the red line, which is group two, and this is um, 10, 10, 10, 2, you can see that you get a, um, a similar response here in mesozeaxanthin. But the important thing is that we know now that if you give our patients at-risk individuals or people with the disease mesozeaxanthin in supplement, 
they will definitely respond to it. So you can have confidence. I think that's very important. But here's the most provocative finding from, from this trial so far. And that is, in the group given um, the green line, group one, <coughs> given no mesozeaxanthin, given no mesozeaxanthin, they were just given 20 milligrams of lutein and 2 milligrams of zeaxanthin. When we performed our, our mesozeaxanthin response, we expected to see no, no response. But what we detected was that by eight weeks, there was, in fact, a significant amount of mesozeaxanthin in those individuals. And this is important because up until now, it was hypothesized that the, the retina was the only place that mesozeaxanthin was, was generated. And I believe this data, and we checked it, and we actually re-ran the samples, and we checked for washover with the system that there was just nothing being carried over. It's an absolutely true finding. And it becomes more interesting now when we look at the data in more detail. And it appears, and I don't have the slides here today, but it appears that the AMD subjects were, didn't generate mesozeaxanthin in their blood, but the normal subjects did. And this may be going back to what I originally suggested around the genetic and the enzymatic deficiency that's relinked to genes. Okay? But again, if you look at the AMD subjects that were supplemented with mesozeaxanthin, so if you give them, they can respond to it. So that's very, very important. Okay? In terms of the, the macular pigment, again, I, I'll be brief here, but get to the, to the important message. There's a very clear finding here. There was a significant increase in macular pigment at all eccentricity. So we measured at the very center and across the profile out to, se out to seven degrees. I present to you the data from the very center and you can see here that the, the, the best increase and very quickly, I have to say, was seen in the group given 10, 10, 2. So again, the message consistent with Paul Bernstein's study showing the antioxidant effect. The message here with respect to response is that best response here in the eye. This is where we want it to be. We want it to be in our eye. That's where it can protect us against age-related macular degeneration. The best response was seen in a formulation containing 10 milligrams of lutein, 10 milligrams of mesozeaxanthin, and a small amount of, of zeaxanthin. Okay? And I think that's very, very important. One other thing, and I think this is particularly important for optometrists, and it, it'll answer a question around when does one recommend supplements and to who? Um, I'll come back to that later, but with respect to the macular pigment data in terms of who can respond, we, we, performed, we divided our data into three groups, people with very low starting points, very high starting points. And as you would expect, and this is consistent with a, the, a publication, the Luna study, Michael Trishman, people who had the lowest starting point, less than 0.3 optical density units, showed the biggest response. So they, they, sh they had more room to respond for one, but they were the people that essentially were, were thirsty for, for carotenoids, and we were able to detect the biggest response in the people with the low. And you can see here from the box plot that that, that was indeed the case. Now I'm moving on to, um, and it's good timing, we're moving on to the last, but probably the most exciting part of our, our data from the, the mesozeaxanthin ocul ocular supplementation trial so far. And that's, I put this slide purposely up again to remind you, let's remember, we know that if you are at increased risk of AMD, you have less pigment years before you get the disease. So a 40-year-old man that smokes cigarettes, that has a family history, has less pigment than a 40-year-old man who doesn't smoke cigarettes and doesn't have a family history, age and so on. Again, remember I said that not only is that the case, but they have this <coughs> atypical profile and I, we believe that that being due to a lack of mesozeaxanthin because we know mesozeaxanthin is at the very centre of their macular pigment. Okay? So what we did was, and that just confirms that, what we did was we looked, we had a database of, I think it was, there you go, we had a database with full spatial profile measurements of 478 subjects. Okay? So that, that was a lot, a very, very six years of work of, of measuring macular pigment in the normal population. Now again, remember, these people had no eye disease. They were, like everyone in this room, no ocular pathology, okay? We measured accurately um, their spatial profile, and what we found was that 12% <clears throat> had what we now term as a central dip in the macular pigment profile. Now it's important that you take two things from this slide. Number one is that there's a dip and we believe that to be due to mesozeaxanthin. But number two is, you may have a lot of macular pigment, okay, so you may have someone like here, but still have a central dip. 
And I again believe that this is due to a lack of mesozeaxanthin. So you may have low macular pigment and have a central dip, but having a dip is not just due to the fact that you have low pigment. It's due to a fact, I believe, you're lacking in mesozeaxanthin. Now here's what's important. That was in 12% of our population. That's interesting, I think, because if you look at the prevalence of AMD, age of 70 is about 10 to 15%, depending on uh, the population under investigation. Um, <clears throat> So what we did, and again thanks to support by the Howard Foundation, we invited all those subjects, all the 58 of them back to take part in an event, interventional trial. Because what we wanted to do here was see that if, could we fix the problem, i.e. could we fix the central dip. And what we found was that, um, again we used the same three interventions, okay, we measured them at baseline four weeks and eight weeks, so we used the same three interventions, and let's just remind because it's important we, we understand the high lutein group, the combined group between lutein and meso, and the high meso zeaxanthin group, so if you can try and visualize that. So let's see what, what happened. We brought them in, we gave them one of these three interventions, we measured them at baseline to confirm that they did have the central dip and that was confirmed, and then we supplemented them and measured them over time. There was a difference um, at baseline here in age, which um, we controlled for throughout the remainder of the analysis. So group three were in fact uh, a younger group and that just happened <coughs> by chance. Um, <clears throat> here's the data shown, quite a busy slide. I don't expect you to take much from it, but what you can see here is that the significant increases were seen in group two. Now remember, we're talking about a very unique population. These are the people in the population that are dipping in central pigment that I believe are lacking mesozeaxanthin. Here's what we found. The mesozeaxanthin group um, were able to increase at the very center at 0.25 uh, degrees of eccentricity. When they were given all three supplements, we can see that um, they had the best effect. Lutein couldn't fix the problem. So the 20 milligrams of lutein couldn't fix the problem, and you'll see clearly in the common slides. Here's the lutein one. You have baseline, okay, that's your red line, and your blue line is what happened after eight weeks of supplementation with 20 milligrams of lutein. There was, I think, one subject that showed a slight augmentation, but the statistical conclusion here is that there was no alteration in the profile of pigment in this subject, in these subjects, rather, over the eight weeks of intervention. That's the statistical conclusion here. So lutein didn't fix the problem. When we gave them the high amount of mesozeaxanthin, the 18 milligrams of mesozeaxanthin, you can see here that we were able to fix the problem centrally and to a statistically significant level. Again, this almost proves um, what I suggested, and that was that it was a deficiency in mesozeaxanthin in, in these individuals. But here's the clear winner. Again, consistent with Paul Bernstein's lab, consistent with the synergistic antioxidant effect and how antioxidants can help each other, not only in how they function, but in how they can be taken into the body. Here we can see a massive increase centrally here when you supplement with a 10-10-2 formulation, but not just centrally. We enrich the entire pigment profile across the retina. And this, I believe, is essential to optimize and enrich pigment in a way that it can optimize its antioxidant and light filtering properties. And um, all this data now has been prepared for publication in, 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 in journals. So to conclude, um, MOST3 as well as some other comments, MOST3 is a clinical trial where we're working with the University of Wisconsin, again supported by the Howard Foundation. Um, and we're looking at these interventions, now that we know we can enrich pigment uniquely, just as I've shown you, with, with mesozeaxanthin, the question is, can that have an impact? Can that impact on AMD patients in, in a way that we believe and hope, hope it will? So that trial is currently um, 14 months in, in, in on, ongoing and we take stereo fundus photographs from certified photographers, they get sent to the University of Wisconsin, Professor Ron Klein, we're working with his laboratory who is a world leader in risk factors and AMD and grading. We'll be, we'll be looking at the images in very close detail. Of course we're measuring pigment and, and visual function over time in these patients as well. So that's what most three, so that, that's again we're using the same three interventions that I've been speaking about today. Most vision as well as looking at a visual performance. Um, 
I have a little bit of good news, and that is um, we've just, on, on Friday, got a significant grant from the Framework 7 programme, European Union, which will commit in the region of €3 million Euros, um, to carotenoid uh, clinical trials over the next five years. So while we have so much data to, to publish, and that's coming, and you're the first people, by the way, to see this, this unique data, we now have a support, and I'm delighted that we have support from Europe to, to really um, continue to answer and ask these questions. So um, this, is, this is great news for me personally, and, and obviously for my research team and the lab. Um, so I'd like to thank everybody for listening. I apologise for my voice early on. I'm, I'm not sure what quite happened there, but I think I recovered okay. Um, I, I, I would be delighted to answer any questions um, that you may have. I'd like to thank my, my, my team particularly for, for this data because, as you can imagine, with the enormity of data, the likes of our research technicians, PhD students, um, you know, we couldn't do it without them. And the guidance then, of course, of Professor Beattie and collaboration with Dr. Lockman is essential. So um, thank you very, very much. I will again remind you that the idea around, you know, uh, the evidence for AMD, Sarah has a poster today, Katie has a poster on, on the methodology, how we measure this pigment, and, and Etna will have some, some data as well on the safety of measles disease. And, and so take advantage of discussing um, that, that particular data with our students, and I'll be around for the day as well. So please ask any questions that you may have.